Okay. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Before beginning, we acknowledge with a sense of gratitude and debt that, we, that the land on which stands this campus and school belongs to the traditional unceded territories of the Algonquin Nation, and we recognize our responsibility to adhere to and honor Indigenous values. Thank you all for coming to the second lecture of the 2023-24 Forum Lecture Series, which we've titled Common Cause, in discussion with our director, Anne Bordelot. Forum is a wonderful tradition in our school, made possible by the generous support of our sponsors, many of whom are here this evening. We've not hosted a forum lecture inside the school for quite a few years, and we're happy to welcome you here tonight in our cozy um, Carmen Cornell designed, uh, Carmen and Ellen Cornell designed building of the 1970s. Um, where we spend our time, so it's very special for us that this lecture is here tonight. Forum aims to expand our students' learning and contribute to the life of our broader community, and I'm sure this will be the case with tonight's guest who has worked with focus and creativity on the topic of affordable housing throughout his career in London, England. The topic of dwelling for the living income earner, as modernist Ernst May termed, affordable housing in the 1920s is a profound one that invites soul searching and reflection about fairness, about what each human being is entitled to, and about caring and mutual support. Described by The Independent as one of the UK's leading urbanists, and we know that housing makes the city after all, Peter Barber has created inspiring affordable housing projects that in addition to earning national and international awards, live up to Ernst May's motto of being not minimal housing merely, but maximum housing at reasonable cost. Prior to establishing his own practice in 1980, Peter Barber worked with Richard Rogers and Will Alsop, but the trajectory of his path was likely drawn much further back into his youth when he traveled from his hometown of Guildford, England, to Botswana, across, right across the border from South Africa, to work on a building maintenance team in an experimental, multiracial, and socially diverse school during apartheid. He said to me, I'm not from a family of architects, but at that school, I began to see the social dimension of our environment, and I suppose this is something that stayed with me. Peter followed an earnest path from there as he went on to work for an architect as, as he put it, a sandwich boy, did I get that right? A sandwich boy at the bottom of the pile working in the print room among other humble tasks. Peter studied in Sheffield during the Thatcher and Minor Strike years and then worked in London for a firm that specialized in housing. Peter put it this way, they were not particularly well-known practice, but they had their heart in the right place. From there, Peter went on to study at London Polytechnic, now called University of Westminster, where he teaches one day a week to this day. Such projects as Kiln Place, McGrath Road, 95 Peckham Road, have received Reba Housing Design Awards. Peter won the Royal Academy Grand Prize for Architecture in 2015. 2021 was a big year during which he won the AJ Contribution to the Profession Award, the Reba Nev Brown, Nev Brown Prize for Architecture, and was given an Order of the British Empire. In 2023, he was the annual recipient of the prestigious Sir John Soane Medal, and he has been mid and short, he has been on mid and short list for the Sterling Prize and the Aga Khan Award for Architecture. In 2019, his work was the subject of a major retrospective exhibition titled 100 Mile City and Other Stories at the D London Design Museum. And in 2023, he curated the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition Architecture Room with a show titled, and you'll all love this in this school, Making is Thinking. And Peter is a maker of buildings, and I understand he also makes music and takes breaks with his staff in the basement of his office where he bangs on a piano. So perhaps later this evening. And with no further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Peter Barber. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay, okay. Right. Thank you for, uh, thanks for the invitation, Janine, and the whole college. Uh, it's really lovely to be here. Uh, I'm here with part of my family enjoying some time in Ottawa, and it's already been a fantastic time. We arrived on Sunday, and the sun's been shining. We've done cycle rides, and um, it's a beautiful city. So thank you so much for getting us over here. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk for about an hour, and I'm going to, as you perhaps expect, show, show some pictures of our um, projects, our constructed projects, and then I'll go on to talk about some, some, some sketched projects, some, some sort of dream projects, some, some projects which could never really be built, but which are a good way of kind of being more speculative about architecture. But before I do either of those things, I'd like to talk a little bit about the context that we work uh, in in London and in the UK. And it'd be interesting to hear from you in the question, questions at the end, uh, you know, what, what, whether these are experiences which you share here. I suspect they might be everywhere I go. There seems to be the same sorry tale around housing and the way it dominates people's lives. Um, th so this first slide is a picture of uh, clearly a demonstration that we took part in in London. Um, and it reminds me to uh, share with you the thought that um, our housing crisis in London, and for all I know the same here, uh, is a consequence of the mismanagement of the land economy by governments of uh, both complexions, Labour and Tory, uh, since, about the, in, since the 1970s. Uh, in 1977, nearly half the population of London, uh, of the UK, lived in social housing, enjoyed the benefits uh, of living inexpensively in social housing. We didn't have a housing crisis. And in the aftermath of the Second World War, when our country was broke, we seemed somehow to be able to manage to build 150,000 social homes a year, an immense number. Uh, so as I say, that by the, by the 70s, nearly half the country lived in social housing and, and enjoyed that kind of incredible, incredible benefit. In 1977, we had a housing act uh, brought in by Margaret, Th uh, Margaret Thatcher and, and Michael Heseltine, uh, which brought that to a close. And effectively, local authorities were no longer able to build social housing. Uh, and the social housing that was has, by degree, in the last 50 or 60 years, been flogged off, sold off either to the individuals who live in that social housing at a discount or to uh, bigger sort of private interests who tear the social housing down and put private housing in its place. Um, and I would argue that housing is a basic, basic uh, a, a right uh, and not a commodity, although it's been com uh, utterly commodified in our country in the last 50 or 60 years. And so sites like this, this is an incredible um, bit of social housing that was built in the, I guess in the 60s, uh, the, 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 you know, pictures like this, vision, uh, views like this are, are not unusual now uh, in the UK. And this um, picture is quite well captioned by a quote from our Prime Minister from uh, 2016, David Cameron, who said this. Post-war estates across the country are ripe for redevelopment. We will sweep away the planning blockages and take new steps to reduce political and reputational risk for projects, key decision makers, and investors. I believe that together we can tear down anything that stands in our way. And tear them down, they have. And in many instances, this is what replaces it. Uh, it's vast uh, developments uh, built by big capital, often from overseas, but often also uh, locally. Uh, in which uh, so indigenous uh, and traditional street-based housing is knocked down and replaced by this sort of stuff. Um, and much of the, this is in Battersea in South London, and much of the housing in this project is empty because it's built as an investment vehicle rather than as a home. Uh, and in consequence, we have currently about 30,000 empty homes in London in a city where there are 170,000 homeless people, 7,000 people living on the streets. There are 30,000 homes left empty because they're simply uh, a, a place for somebody to park some money rather than to park a, a person, a, 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 you know, a human being. And, and, and this is the outcome. So there are seven, you know, London, one of the richest cities the world's ever seen, probably. There are 7,000 people living like this. This is in a subway a few hundred yards away from Apsley House and from Buckingham Palace. And this is somebody's bed 
or bedroom, you might say. It's a project run by a friend of mine who gave cameras, disposable cameras, to homeless people uh, and invited them to take pictures of their world. And so this is one person's bed, and this is somebody else's. So this is a one-bedroom flat in Knightsbridge. The price tag is 15 million pounds for a one-bedroom flat. So this is about inequality, and it's about um, the allocation of resources and about ideology uh, in the wrong places. And the idea of property and housing as commodity rather than as basic infrastructure. In my view, it's as an important part of infrastructure as a railway or a road, and we should be seeing it that way. And the problem of empty homes isn't just in London. It's spread across our country in areas run down uh, as a consequence of industrial decline. And I think rather than thinking about housing policy in isolation, we might think about housing policy in connection with other areas of policy, so that if we thought about uh, investing into places like this in the north of England, uh, we might actually over get over a significant amount of, of the problem of, of homelessness by bringing houses like this, rather beautiful houses like this, back into, back into use. There are half a million empty homes in the UK at the moment. Whole streets of really rather lovely streets of Victorian housing that are looking like this. So, um, and I think, that, that, you know, the, the solution to the housing crisis, in our country at least, is rather straightforward. We simply need to end the right to buy, of, of, of individuals to buy their homes at a discount, because ultimately it means that our, uh, our public housing stock is, is dissipated. Uh, we need to introduce rent controls so that people are not paying outrageous amounts of rent. And we need to be building large quantities of uh, social housing at the rate that we were building them in after the Second World War, as I say, about 150,000 homes a year. And if we did those three things, problem solved. But it's a question of political will um, and, uh, and ideology, as I said. It's a, these are choices made by politicians. But I think we have to share in the responsibility of the misery created for people by the housing crisis, because we live in a democracy. We have access to the ballot box. We have um, the ability to say what we feel in the press. And we have direct action. Um, and so, um, you know, I think we need, and I'm talking with the we in, in, in London and in the UK, need to kind of hang our heads in shame, really. A very wealthy country uh, with an unnecessary housing problem. This brings me to a, a, a more, you might say, conventionally architectural discourse. Um, and um, I, I'm fascinated by the relationship between people and buildings, between architecture and, and culture. On the one hand, we design our buildings, don't we? Uh, and, and, uh, but on the other hand, they also come back and impact on us. So we design the buildings to be in a certain way, and then they liberate us or constrain us or limit us or open, thing, open possibilities up for us. And I'm, I love the idea of an architecture that's permeable, that invites occupation. And it's my firm belief that architecture is really nothing until it has the color and the life of people's lives laid out onto it, uh, and it sort of erupts into life, rather as shown in this picture here. And I'm going to read you a little quote which is very dear to my heart. It's by an extraordinary man called Walter Benjamin. Uh, who uh, was a cultural critic, very left-wing communist cultural critic in the early part of the last century, uh, and a great writer too. Um, and he wrote a lovely book called One Way Street in which he describes uh, in each chapter a different uh, impo important European city. And the, that really, the, the, the uh, chapter that really captures my imagination is his, his description of the city of Naples, uh, which is this one. And, um, he, and, he's, and his, this quote really rejoices in that idea of, of, of people's, you know, as I say, life being breathed into architecture by its occupation and it really not being anything uh, until that happens. So it's an architecture of sort of permeability, one which invites occupation. Anyway, he puts it better than me. The passion for improvisation demand, and, and he's describing this precise scene, the passion for improvisation demands that space and opportunity be at any price preserved. Buildings are used as a popular stage. They're all divided into innumerable simultaneously animated theaters. Balcony, courtyard, window, gateway, staircase, roof are at the same time stages 
and boxes. So he, he thinks of the, the, um, of, the, of, the, of the city as a kind of theatre where we're both, we're, both, we're both performers but also observers. We're an audience but we're also actors. Um, as porous as the stone is the architecture, buildings and action interpenetrate in the courtyards, the arcades and stairways. In everything, they preserve the scope to become a theater of new unforeseen constellations. The stamp of the definitive is avoided. No situation appears intended forever. And so when I'm confronted by a, by a blank sheet of paper with perhaps a site plan on it, wondering how to design a project, uh, those sort of words echo in my mind, and I try to kind of visualize what's going to be happening in those spaces, as well as the architectural form which will make that possible. So this is a street in Brighton, where in the south of England, where I spend a lot of time, and it's a reminder me to say something to you about streets. Um, as Janine was alluding to, um, uh, when we design housing, urban housing, we're really designing the city. And in a city like Br Brighton or London, 70% of all of the buildings are houses or housing. So it's what our city's made of. Uh, it's, what, it's what sort of compresses public space into streets. It's what, it's what surrounds our squares and creates that sort of sense of enclosure which brings us together. And you know, well-designed street makes a city which is very easy to understand. Uh, it's easy to, to sort of navigate and understand. Uh, but it also uh, plays its part in the sort of social world of the city because it brings people together. And in a street like this, there'll be black people, there'll be white people, there'll be rich people, there'll be poor people, there'll be young people, there'll be old people. And so the street plays this extraordinary role in kind of bringing people together in a way that they almost never are. Uh, uh, and um, in this incredibly sort of informal setting where people can be themselves. And that brings me to you know, another urban space which I find inspiring here. We're now in Marrakesh, uh, in Morocco. Uh, and this is a space now somewhat kind of touristy, but the essence of it is still there, really. In the, in the cool of the evening, the, the, the little alleyways, the shady alleyways of the city disgorge into uh, this clearing at the side of the, at the edge of the city. And it's a public space which is not made by kind of uh, monumental buildings, important buildings. It's just more of a clearing. And the thing that I find extraordinary about it is the manner in which um, this incredible scene, un, uh, you know, and has done for the last thousand years, this incredible scene sort of uh, it develops where, um, you know, sort of impermanent pieces of architecture are dragged out uh, to form a, a, a kitchen or a stage. Uh, little circles of people form around uh, snake charmers or storytellers or musicians, uh, and in a sense of making architecture with their own bodies. Um, and um, I, I love that about it. It's kind of ephemeral, it's ever-changing. Walter Benjamin would have loved it. Um, and this reading of it, and, and you know, public space is extraordinary because it belongs to everybody, doesn't it? But it belongs to nobody at the same time. So these spaces like this are spaces in which people can kind of be themselves uh, uh, in a relatively, clearly there are regulations, but in a relatively unregulated way and express themselves and be together. And that, and that reading of the space is reinforced by the name of this space, which is Gemma Al-Fanar. And, and, and the one of the translations of Gemma Al-Fanar is a mosque of nothing. And I love the idea of public space being a mosque of nothing, a space where you can kind of, kind of do whatever you like. And again, that, re that reading is reinforced by the fact that behind the photographer, uh, of, in this ever-changing kind of ephemeral world of people's bodies and, and, and this movement, is the mosque of Marrakesh, the ancient mosque of Marrakesh. Walls kind of two, three meters thick, emblematic of a completely unchanging, uh, a monument to, to it's got a, an unchanging ideology, fixed and, and, and so on and its counterpoint in public space. And um, so that's the thought about public space. I want to tell you a tiny bit about our office. Um, um, and I'm going to, before I do, I'm going to read you this, because one of my favorite architects is a South American, Italian South American architect, Lina Bobardi. And so clearly that's our shop front uh, in King's Cross. And um, she's worth looking up. And uh, she says this about sh shop fronts. The city is a public space, a great exhibition offering all kinds of subtle readings, and anyone who has a shop, a window display, or any showcase of this kind has to assume a moral responsibility which requires that their window display might help to shape the taste of the city dwellers, help to shape the face of the city, and reveal something of its essence. And so I really love having this. You know, everything I say about sort of the streets being the basic building block of the city and, and, and so on, it's kind of exemplified in our, 
in our little uh, shop front in King's Cross, and we have all sorts of people knocking on the door, um, you know, tourists, local people, homeless people. There's a big hostel around the corner. Uh, and uh, it's lovely to have that kind of connection with our community, uh, both local community and also a wider one, and, and to be able to share our ideas. And people are really fascinated to, to kind of peer in and look at these models. So that's the interior. And we work, we're very analog. We, we, we don't use the computer a lot, especially in the early stages, the design stage, the creative stages of a project. The computer comes in for doing working drawings. But when we're designing our projects, we make models. And we, they're, sometimes, they're sometimes sort of very pristine presentation models, but very often they're working models. And we hack bits off and, 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 and use them as a design tool. We don't necessarily draw it first. We very often, the, the, the model is the, is the, is the tool uh, for the design process. And that's our roof terrace. We have fun too. That's lunches and you know, occasional evenings on a sunny evening. And that's, that's us. Very, very small office. And I love the idea of a small office. And I, I kind of do everything I can to resist the growth of the office, because I think if we can be around a, a table discussing ideas, uh, and if we can have easy, uncomplicated relationships, uh, then it, creativity is, is much more easy to deal with. We work with sketches. So uh, again, I don't really use the computer at all in the development of the early stages of a scheme. Um, it's, it's layers of this yellow paper, which is see-through, built up. And when you go, uh, you know, over a period of hours, and then when you go back through the paper, you can see the sort of, it's quite fascinating sometimes. I wish it was as straightforward as this, actually. But um, <laughs> seeing the process of, of the design kind of developing, sometimes there's lots of mistakes and, and dead ends and things like that. But, uh, you know, um, so that's, that's and, and sometimes drawings from above to get the overall form, but sometimes getting down to, 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 down to eye level. So I think there's room for thinking about architecture from the point of view, the sort of master plan, which is you know, frowned on a bit these days because it sounds a bit kind of uh, um, you know, authoritarian. But I think we need to be able to understand the city from above as a plan. But then I think it's really important to get down to ground level and to, to, you know, that one has sort of sympathy, sympathy, sympathy with um, um, that, that kind of way of looking at the city, of, of, of the sort of experience of being in the city. So there's a sort of bigger master plan model. Again, that's foam. So that was us designing, cutting pieces out. So it's a process of erasure as much of, as, as adding things on. And then the larger scale models where we can start to understand the sort of fenestration, the windows a bit more. And then, you know, 1 to 50, we're looking into the interiors and understanding the sort of courtyards that we're creating. So look, here we are at, at uh, one of our first bigger built projects. It's called Donnybrook Quarter. Um, and it was a competition that we won. Uh, that's the marvels of uh, you know, Google Earth, um, being able to see the thing from above. So the site is quite clearly that. Uh, and it's a competition that 150 people went in for. And it invited us to make homes for 50 or so people. And most of the other proposals were a, a fence around a, a site and a building sitting in the middle of the site. But we said in our competition entry, this project is a celebration of the public social life of the street. The competition didn't ask for, about streets, it was asking about housing, but we were putting what we felt to be the most important component of the project, uh, you know, absolutely centerpiece to our proposal. So our proposal makes a street going through there, a street going through there, and it widens out into a sort of court, uh, a shared square in the middle. So rather than it being kind of metic and cut off, it's a project which invites people in and invites people to walk through. And you know, the sort of soundtrack that I've been giving you up to now about the importance of the street, the possibilities of a street, um, are borne out really in this proposal. Very contextless uh, drawing here, but a helpful one in some ways. So each one of those is not one house, it's two houses. Uh, that front door leads into a ground floor home, which has a back courtyard. You can just about see it there. But this courtyard is at first floor level. It's accessed, you ring on the doorbell there, you walk up that, through that gate, and up into a courtyard there, and perched up on top is a two-story house. So that's a two-bedroom house, and that's a two-bedroom flat, and that repeats down the street. And you know, people were very anxious. People were saying, well, why aren't the front gardens to these, to these, to these uh, houses? Because that was the orthodoxy at the time, and people talked about defensible space. And my view about that is kind of, well, defense from what? Defense from my neighbors, defense from other people. And you know, I feel kind of hopeful and optimistic about the city, 
and uh, this is the house I used to live in, um, and uh, you know the possibilities that start to happen when people have a very intimate relationship with the street and the pavement outside their house, and the colour uh, and life that can start to emerge when people do that. Um, I'm interested in quite traditional forms of housing, although a lot of our stuff looks quite kind of contemporary. Uh, the, the idea of old-fashioned typologies. So when we do a block of flats, uh, you wouldn't look at that and say that's flats, but it actually is. You get this is called um, they're called cottage flats in England. I don't know if you have them here, but that's an entrance into that ground floor flat. That's an entrance into that one, and it kind of repeats over there. So it's a bit like having a house with your front door on the street rather than walking in through a, through a shared front door and down corridors and up in lifts and on decks. Um, and, so, uh, and, and then the other, the other sort of component of our project is that there was a lot of emphasis on roof terraces. So rather than big back gardens, you know, con conventional terrace housing is very land hungry, we said let's give people these extraordinary uh, uh, roof gardens. And so there it is. That's not a CGI, that's a photograph of a built project taken from a tower block just next door. So we said, wouldn't it be great if everybody had their own front door on the street? Out, and wouldn't it be great if everybody also had their own piece of outside space in the form of a courtyard or a roof terrace? So it's a peculiar typology. It's the sort of cottage reworking of those cottage flats I was talking about. Um, and it's sort of terraced housing, but it's actually terraced housing, sort of double stack terraced housing. And every home here opens out directly out onto the street. So, and, and you know, my, my feeling is that people are much more likely to get to know their neighbors or at least recognize their neighbors, maybe wave to them uh, on a street, on, uh, in the shared space of the street, than they are in a corridor in a block of flats. And so wherever possible, that's the, what we try to adopt. So these photographs taken you know, the day the project was completed, so not a lot happening in terms of its occupation. But you know, as, as I say, very intimate relationship between the street and the interior, and these oriel windows pushing out over the street. Um, you know, so that people can look up and down the street. Jane Jacobs, of course, talks about eyes on the street and the idea that a street is much safer if it feels as though people who are living on either side are looking out onto it. So, and the other thing that happens is here that these become like little sort of display cabinets as well. So people will put in a, a, some flowers or a favourite object and so on. So, so again, you know, you can see this facade blurs the relationship between the, the interior, the private interior of a home, and the street. It's a, it's a project that has lots of repetition in it, but there are little moments uh, which, where we went to town, you know, so on a, on a corner, uh, and to that extent, one has uh, uh, sympathy with the idea of architecture being sort of um, cinematic or, or picturesque, so that one thinks of it as, as you walk around, sort of views opening up and, and, and something like that presenting itself. So that would be a, a bit of the building that we take a bit more trouble with. And then this, uh, sort of, we have very strict rules about back-to-back -back distances in our country. And the reason why uh, terraced housing is usually very inefficient is that when you have a row of terraced houses there and a row of terraced houses there, the rule that we have is that you need about 30 meters, 30 yards, between the backs of one house and the backs of another house so that somebody looking from their window there can't easily see into the window there. So what Donnybrook does is it breaks that rule but it kind of gets round it in another way, so that that's only eight meters, so kind of from here to there. Um, but there are no sub substantial windows in the back of the building. All the upper units look sideways into their own courtyard, and the lower units, there's privacy because of the separation created by this wall here. Uh, and again, lovely to go back and to see what people are doing with these places. Doesn't happen every time, uh, but when it does, it's pretty nice to see. As I say, there are little special moments where something special happens. And well, we made quite a big mistake when we did this project, because I thought it would be a really nice idea to put a window in everybody's front door. But of course, nobody wants to be seen when they answer the door, do they? That's why you have those little, those little things. So, so, but this is what's happened. And um, so sometimes the worst mistakes lead to quite nice, happy accidents. And every time I go down there, every single window has a little picture put in by one of the residents of the block. And um, that's the architect's house, by the way. So this is the second of the, of the built projects I'm going to show you. It's, it's much more conventional terraced housing. That's just a row of townhouses. 
And at the back, uh, there's a little row of cottages on one floor for people with kind of mobility problems. Um, and um, so the arch became a thing in this one. And I think the sort of, again, this sort of relationship between the interior of a building and the street and the celebration of the entrance with these arches and with this quite um, elaborate... I, I went on a student trip to India and came back with these, they call them Jali walls in India. So imported that back to North London. Um, but this is, this is so, social housing. You know, the sad thing is that thousands of people applied for the, for the homes in this, in this project. It's for a local authority, it's for council, uh, and they filled them up you know, in, in seconds. So the third of the projects is another one. This, this one is on a kind of housing estate, quite a rough housing estate in the east end of London. Uh, and these around two sides were uh, existing social housing, but they had these sort of garages and stores. Uh, and the, the, the people that lived in these homes are, are big extended families who were living in two bedroom flats, very often a grandmother, uh, parents, children, sometimes grandchildren. And um, uh, we were invited by a housing association to, do, to, do, to build housing on this space uh, so that people living in overcrowded accommodation could move into much bigger homes built in this, on this green. And it was quite a sort of, uh, you know, joyless place, but one's always looking as an architect for something to latch hold of, which is kind of gives you a kind of hope. And the thing that gave me hope were these gardens and this sort of hodgepodge of fences and roses and little, you know, children's toys and things like that. And so that became the inspiration for the project. So the houses, the, the fence of the existing houses wrapped around here, and we, we conceptually, our terrace of new houses was, was pushed back so we could keep that green space, which we thought was important, but although they were very happy for us to build on it. Uh, and we build it in timber so that it felt like a kind of extension of that. These houses had their gardens. Our new, uh, new houses would have roof terraces, each one of those being a six and in some cases, seven bedroom house. So again, the model, as I say, we pushed it right back so that this would be maintained as a space for new residents, but also for the existing residents. And that's it built. So that's a, a very large house there um, and um, a little playground in the middle and people starting to move in. And, and, you know, I went back. I love, I love going back. It's, it's, sometimes it's disappointing, but sometimes this happens, and you can see that people are really doing what you, what you hoped would happen uh, in a manner, uh, say, that uh, Walter Benjamin, would, Benjamin, I think, would be pleased, you know, that the thing starts to become something. So um, you'll see that um, a lot of our stuff is using quite old-fashioned housing types, terraced housing, double stack units. Uh, there's another house type in England. I don't know if you have it here. It's called back-to-back -back housing. And it's a type of housing which was uh, kind of became very, very uh, well, predominant in the, in the Victorian period as our cities grew rapidly with their industrialization. And rather than a terrace of housing with there and a terrace of housing there with, with back gardens in between. What the developers did then was to say we could get a lot more people more efficiently if we move those two terraces of houses, that one facing that way, that one that way, if we move them right together so there was no back garden and they shared a back wall. And um, there's, there's some of it left, and, and it's quite rare in London, but this is one such in London. And what happens when you've got no back garden is that sort of quite extraordinary things can start to happen in front of the houses. Uh, as you can see here. So these only face this way and these only face this way. And so everybody invests uh, in the space that they share with their neighbours. And um, so this is called Schumann Square. It's in Peckham in South London. And it's a joy to go down there. So we were asked to look at an old garage site of garages in suburban East London. Those are garages which remained. But we knocked our gar the garages on this bit down and we built two rows of houses. Now this is housing for elderly people. Well, I say elderly. Six, uh, people over 60, so I could get in if I wanted to, but um, uh, not, not, not keen to. So, so, but the, the, point, the serious point here is that the, um, the indices of, of loneliness in this group of people are, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty, pretty sobering stuff. 
uh, uh, you know, people who have perhaps lost a spouse, who've given up work, uh, whose children have left home. Um, and so, a bit like that last slide, I thought, wouldn't it be great to sh put a space down the middle which was shared by all of these older people living there, and, you know, what might then be possible, the, 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 the relationships which might emerge around that space. Uh, but, but, you know, and I wasn't sure, but we did it. And this photograph's taken about a week, maybe two weeks after people had moved in. No back gardens. They suddenly move in, into these spaces. And if you go down there on a summer's day, people are always are sitting out there. Their front doors are open. That's Pauline there. That's me paying her a visit. And what was interesting was, so this group of, age group of people were people who grew up in terraced housing in the old east end of London in the 60s, 50s, 60s. And that terraced housing was bulldozed because it was considered to be slum housing. Uh, and they were put into tower blocks. So Pauline and her neighbours, for them, it's a bit of a homecoming. You know, they kind of, oh, OK, yeah, this is how we used to live. And um, they're very kind of, kind of, they're reminded of the world that they grew up in, uh, which was kind of a much more sociable world uh, where they lived along a street. And so, kind of slightly emboldened by the success of that project, we thought it'd be interesting to kind of ramp it up a bit. And so this is, on, again, on a state in East, East London. These are sort of Victorian houses, but this is a modernist estate. And there was this bit of ground here. And um, that is a row of houses there facing out onto the street. But that's another row of houses facing into this courtyard. And rather than being single stories, these were whole, uh, whole houses. So uh, that's a house there, that's a house there, that's a house there, but facing this way. And then those ones are facing that way. So there's a, there's a kitchen, there's a bedroom, there's a bedroom, and then on the top floor, is a living room. One of the, one of the sort of criticisms of uh, traditional back-to-back -back housing was that you really only get sun and daylight from one direction. So we cut this notch into the, t the upper floor so that uh, this room here looks out over the street, gets sun from there, gets sun from there, and also has a roof light. So the kind of the, the accusation that you're re rebuilding slum housing by doing this, housing that's poorly ventilated, has poor lighting, uh, we can deal with. But we have many of the benefits that come with terraced housing over flats. Now, there are very, there's very little back-to-back uh, uh, -back housing left, but if you go up to Birmingham, where there was once 30,000, you know, everybody lived in back-to-back -back houses, they've kept six of them as a sort of museum. And uh, I was really worried about doing back-to-back. -back. In fact, I was doing a t before we did this project, I was doing a talk at the RIBA in London in this huge hall, and I was talking about back-to-back -back housing and what, how, how interesting it would be and all that sort of jazz. And this woman stood up at the end and said, well, I grew up in back-to-back -back housing, and it was hell, which was awkward for me. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, oh, OK, right, OK. But then somebody else stood up and said, well, I grew up in back-to-back -back housing, and it was the happiest time of my life. We knew our neighbors. And what that tells me is that it's a mistake to generalize about housing. And, and you know, for some people living on the, at the edge of a street, you know, knowing their neighbors, being right in the thick of it is their absolute ideal. For somebody else, being on the 20th floor, you know, they're, they're not gregarious type people. They've been with people at work all day. They long just to be on their own with the horizon. And, and I think you know, we need to keep that in mind when we try to tell people what they should have with their housing. So I'm not pretending that this project uh, is right for everybody, um, but... Um, I think there are more than enough people who would love to live like this. And the people that showed me around this museum, by the way, were people who themselves had grown up in back-to-back -back housing a short distance away from these ones that were saved. And, 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 and they were also able to say, you know, we really actually miss the world that we were removed to be put in tower blocks, that we really miss the world. Um, you know, albeit it was, you know, very poorly maintained, the, 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 you know, the, 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 the plumbing, the everything. Um, but I thought if we could get around those sort of issues, uh, it was worth revisiting back-to-back -back housing. So, look, I won't, I'm going to labour it, but those are all the kit that's a ground floor plan, all the kitchens facing that way, and those people are facing into the courtyard. And it's always surprising when they get built. You know, you go along with an idea. They were, they were asking for a block of flats, uh, the, the, it was the local authority. And we said, well, have you thought about this idea? And, and, and they, were, they were kind of persuaded. One of the things that persuaded them was actually there's an economic argument for this type of house. When you build a block of flats, 
20-25% of all of the space that you're building is circulation. It's corridors, it's lifts, it's staircases, it's decks that you've got to build. So your £5 million project, I'm simplifying a bit, £1 million of it is space that you're building which benefits nobody really. So if you can build a project like this, where there is no common area circulation, where the street itself and the square in the middle is the means of circulation, not only does it have incredible social benefits, but there's an economic argument for that as well. So there's your kitchen, there's your bedroom, bedroom, and then the living room on the top floor. So if you're feeling sociable, you're sitting down here, uh, and if you're feeling like you want to be on your own, you can be up, in the, up at the top. So that's the route through into the courtyard. It looks a bit barren again. This is day one. There's one of the kitchens. It's not just about sociability. It's, these are, this is a house with one room per floor, so you, you know, good knees is another... Uh, but there's the living room on the top floor. And then again, to go back, I posted this picture on the internet and this lady got in touch and said, um, you know, my kids really love whizzing around in here on their, on their um, scooters and stuff like that. It, this has really uh, transformed our lives. So this is again, you know, proper old fashioned social housing. So people who really need it, uh, getting respite and getting, uh, you know, a huge relief from the very tricky and difficult situations in which they find themselves. Suddenly, uh, their whole world opens up by it, th this being offered to them by, by the government. And uh, we're very, inter again, interested in this relationship between the interior and the street and the, the, the creation of these arches, which wasn't simple and it wasn't cheap, but we thought it was important was a, a way of thinking about addressing that issue and how one might invite the occupation, the space to the edge of the street by, by adding this, this feature to it. And uh, not every house has done it, but the last slide shows somebody and this is somebody else. And we hope that in time, it sort of snowballs, sometimes somebody does it and then other people kind of follow suit. I mean, some architects hate this, don't they? People messing up their building, but I really like it. It's what it's all about, really. So look, this is one of the worst sites we've been ever given. That there is a six-lane motorway. We're on the North Circular in North London. Um, and this was a site which had been earmarked for a road widening scheme by the Transport for London. And they decided not to do it in the end, so they flogged it back, and our developer client bought it. Um, and they were expecting 30 homes on this site. We've built 100. They were, th they were expecting three apartment buildings dotted along here, but by doing a kind of very site-specific site, site strategy which addresses the issue of the site itself, we, as I say, we were able to do 100 homes. So we built a, a, a building along here which protects the uh, mews, which, which goes through here, and the housing itself from the noise and the dust and the dirt of this road. And the key here is that this, room, this, this building is very thin. It's only one room deep, so that every room in this Built in building, can they open a window onto the quiet muse and doesn't need to open a window onto the really hideous conditions of the, of the, of the road itself. This had planning permission in three or four months. And the reason for that is that these people here, who usually would be the objectors to any kind of housing on their doorstep, they're big, quite, quite posh houses, were thrilled because this, they hadn't been able to sit in their gardens for the last 20 years because they were you know, in the kind of absolutely being dominated by, the, by this, but our proposal was going to improve their world uh, immeasurably. So again, that's a, a very early drawing, and uh, uh, you know, as have been the other drawings I've shown, and the project actually which got built is pretty much like that. So, so, so that's, 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 that's the building. We got somebody down there with a drone the other day, and uh, it, it's, um, yeah. Again, it, it kind of, it's a nice job. Who, how many people are architects here? Admit it, come on. <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, and how many architecture students? Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, I mean, it's, a fa it's a, the most brilliant job, you know, because, because you do a drawing and then, okay, it does take a little while sometimes and it half kills you, the process, but, um, you know, to get from that sketch to, to that is, um, it's, uh, there's not many jobs where you can say that. And, and, and also, you know, when you go back and people are saying, you know, are enjoying being there. It's uh, it's great. So so a very kind of hard edge to the to the motorway, kind of quite heroic. It's 250 meters long. Those are um, bathrooms, incidentally. Um, and you know, again, kind of repetition, but a bit of fun had at either end. And there's a shop at either end as well. 
Um, and then the space, as it's starting to get feel a bit more lived in with people putting kind of, there's a gym there and stuff happening on these roof terraces. So, so each one of those is, is an apartment building. It's got three flats in it. It's a walk-up block. You get ground floor, uh, relatively easy way in, and then you get a, uh, is there a better drawing, photograph? Well, it, there's a row of front doors. Some of them lead up to a second floor flat. Some of them lead straight in to uh, a ground floor and, and lower ground floor flat, and some of them lead up to the first floor. But again, this is the circulation of the project. It's not a corridor. It's not a lift. It's not a deck. And you know, the feedback that we're getting is that this space is starting to be used by the kids. There's a, somebody had some badminton stuff out the other, the other day, and people are getting to know each other. Um, and so the kind of social benefits are, um, are really starting to happen there. It's one of the, probably a show home. Looks like an estate agent had a hand in that. Real estate agent. But then that's somebody's real, real home. And you know, that's somebody's looking at the motorway. But behind me, they're looking back into the muse. And those people are really loving being there. So when our buildings get bigger, this is obviously an apartment building, we still hold on to the importance of the edge, the space at the edge of the street. Uh, and we, we do that by saying that these actually are all little houses. They're maisonettes. They're two-story homes with their own entrances onto the street. Uh, one of them leads into a core which serves the upper units. Uh, and again, uh, with time, these are becoming really nicely well-used uh, spaces. And they're kind of getting greened up. And, 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 the, and the building's kind of slightly disappearing uh, underneath uh, you know, people's world as they put greenery out and stuff like that. And I think the temptation as you do bigger buildings is that you simplify them because it's too complicated, it's too much trouble to have fun with them and to play with their push and pull their form. Uh, and, and we take trouble to try to make sure that the sort of visual complexity uh, is retained even as the buildings get bigger. And at the back of the building is a little courtyard. Uh, and again, to see that getting lived in, so, you know, part of it's a shared courtyard, some of them are individual courtyards for, um, for the house, each flat. There's my colleague Jonah enjoying a shady spot. And then getting a lot bigger, well, this is a, a, another project in North London, about to go in for planning, we haven't got planning permission for it yet, but you can see some of the same themes, a, a care taken with the, the street edge, this sort of ziggurat configuration which gives people a proper piece of outside space, not just a balcony, but a proper roof terraces. A proper roof terrace. This building's on a really big, busy road here, but it steps down to three and four stories to meet the much more suburban hinterland of, of, of uh, semi-detached houses behind. So I think this is the last of the, of the built projects, uh, and it's a homeless hostel. And um, this is what we can do if we put our minds to it, and this has been done by the London Borough of Camden in North London with money from the taxpayer to care for, it's one that not all the boroughs do it, but to care for some of the most uh, vulnerable people in the borough. Um, we used to have uh, you know, uh, hospitals for people with mental health. They were all closed, mental health problems, they were all closed down. So, I mean, a significant portion of people who are homeless in our country, at least, are people with you know, um, mental health problems, but not all of them. Some of them have been kicked out of their social housing, being bulldozed, um, as with that slide I showed at the beginning of the talk. Um, people running into difficulties with substance abuse, uh, increasingly people simply not being able to pay the rent uh, because it's just got too, uh, too difficult, too expensive as a multiplier of their um, salary. So the existing building we decided to retain, retain, we were invited to knock it down, but I think, you know, given the climate emergency, the embodied energy in a building like that, it's criminal to knock it down. So we retain the existing building. Also, I think there's some nice details here. And that's the building fronting the main road. But it's a very, very deep site. So we invited our client to think about knocking this down and to think about this space here at the back in a way that's rather different. Usually, um, hostels are organized like this around a corridor. So you know, you've got mental health problems, and that's how you get to your bedroom. Uh, and, and so I just wondered whether that was the right way to do it. And, and, and I. I wondered about the possibility of a garden and, and little tiny 
homes around the garden, and this is an almshouse. I don't know if, if they, uh, such things exist here, but um, it was the way that traditionally in the UK, uh, people, older people, people with problems were looked after by local parishes and towns, uh, um, uh, and people were given the tiniest house around the garden, a, a place that felt protected uh, and sort of comfortable and, and uninstitutional. And so we uh, thought it would be interesting to do that. And so there's the hostel at the front, and that has more conventional hostel accommodation, so, so ensuite rooms along a corridor, uh, as does this here, actually. But these, each one of those is a tiny house, uh, about that wide, about 16 square metres in area. But it exists around this garden. And we thought that the... the uh, and the other thing, uh, um, it's a, it was a great programme, actually, um, uh, provide, uh, with money provided by the then Labour uh, government, uh, which looked at kind of humanising the hostel environment. So the entrance to hostels traditionally was like a, like a they called it an airlock, where, you, where a person would come into a tiny space, there'd be a little, really Dickensian, little window, and you say, look, I need somewhere for the night, and then the thing would open, yeah, all right, and come in. Uh, whereas the, you know, the entrances now to the new hostels are like this. And, and, you know, that was a space of tremendous tension, you know, when people were like that, and there was lots of violence and stuff. But people now walk into this, uh, and uh, the, uh, on the left-hand side is a desk, and if they're, if they're as, as they often are, distressed and, and stressed out, look, come and sit over here, well, let's, let's talk about what we can do for you, rather than, you know, shuffling through uh, a security block. Uh, the, the other thing going on here is that there are rooms in the hostel where people can get, uh, problems, uh, get, get help with their problems, either with uh, sort of mental health, um, uh, counselling. Uh, they can be taught uh, life skills. So there are life skills to teaching kitchens where people can learn to cook for themselves, can be taught about paying bills and how to, you know, because a lot of these people are people who have been living in institutions and who are unused to taking basic care of themselves and also kind of medical facilities. So, so that was one of the very early drawings. Uh, and it talked about this garden. And that's a very early drawing as well. And I took that to the very first meeting with the council, and I read them this. And this is the council, don't forget. So these are bureaucrats, and you know, but some of them are great. You know, some people working in local authorities in our country retain the kind of vestiges, the residue of a kind of welfare state uh, feeling of responsibility. Uh, to their citizens, and particularly most vulnerable citizens, and we, we had somebody like that. So they were prepared to hear, they had a heart, and they were prepared to hear this. We imagine a group of residents working with a gardener to create and maintain an intensely planted and beautiful garden with an apple tree or two, potatoes, green veg, soft fruit, herbs, a greenhouse, a potting shed, and a sunny spot to sit and rest. We think there ought to be a room, a little room or shed in the garden for private chats. That's what that is. And counselling. Conceived as the social heart of the hostel, the garden creates a homely, domestic atmosphere. It gives participating residents an interest and an outlet for their energy, helping to foster a sense of belonging, self-worth, and empowerment. So you imagine that, 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 that punter, that guest, that, that individual, at the end of that corridor, sitting in a darkened room, freaking out a long, long way away from, you know, any kind of communal space. And imagine this, these people walking out of their front door into a scene like this where, that, where there are other people out there. And, you know, one of the great sort of uh, pluses of these places can be the support that one resident gives to another, as well as the incredible work done by the people that work there. So these photographs are taken very soon after it's finished, but there's a, there's a gardening, I need to go out there and get pictures, a gardening project starting to take shape uh, and this is being dug up, and, and stuff's being put in its place. And again, you know, this extraordinary thing of going back. So this is not that hostel. It's another hostel where the gardening project is more advanced. So the gardening projects are a thing. Uh, so the idea of working th a therapeutic horticulturalist coming in and working with people. This is actually one that we got involved with our practice, and we bought plants and went and worked with the guys in the garden, and that was a very worthwhile uh, 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 you know, and actually um, kind of quite emotional experience. You've got talking to people, you know, everybody's got a memory, a lot of people have got a memory of a garden and people say, well, you know, I remember, this is somebody who's come out of a cardboard box on the street. I remember my mum, you know, she had a garden or a window box and we used to, and uh, so it brought back memories for people, which was uh, extraordinary and, and got them together. So this is one of those tiny houses. That's a section, it's a two-story house 
Uh, there's a you know, tiny kitchenette, uh, a stewed, grandly called a studio, uh, a, a shower room at the back, and then, a, and then a, a steps up onto a bedroom platform, which is up here, which looks back down into the double height space. The model, inevitably, and one of those little uh, houses. The very early in the day when the sun was reflecting off the rooms opposite. So, how are we doing for time? Can I do another five minutes? Yeah. yeah. All right, look, we'll, we'll, da we'll dash through this. This is some sketches. We're getting the thumbs up through. Yeah, okay. Look, this is some, this is some sketches, all right? And, um, well, we'll go straight into it, shall we? Yeah, all right. So, so, uh, so I, I, I teach a day a week, as Janine says, and I live in my sketchbooks as well. So if you're in day-to-day -day practice, despite the sort of rosy picture I've painted of it, it's, it's quite punishing. And it's very easy to get into sort of rather a functional mindset and very easy to just be totally engaged with the here and now and the, the awful environment, social, economic environment that we, that we live in day in, day out, and not to think about how things might be radically different. So I set myself this project, it's called One Year 365 Cities, and the idea was to try and design a city a day for a year. Yeah, well I didn't quite get there, I got kind of halfway there before I kind of ran out of ideas and patience, and, but this is some of them, and you know, you, there was a little bit of, you know, text about each one, was it made out of, was it carved out of the ground, or was it made out of timber from a forest in which it stood, was it... Was it, um, you know, so, so it's about the materials, it's about not just housing, it's about people's world, the, you know, perhaps these are foresters who live in the forest or, you know, and so each one of these is one of those, there's a sort of city in a ravine. And they're kind of throwaway, so, uh, but, but they just get you thinking, and it's quite interesting the way from time to time ideas produced in a kind of rather free mindset in a sketchbook that creep back into the work. I'm not sure whether that last Holmes Road, it's so different from what anybody w would usually do. I'm not sure if it could have happened without you know, the possibilities presented by some of these uh, sketches or by the experience of teaching. And, and I'm one, one of those people who thinks that I get far more out of teaching than, I, than I'm able to give. People sometimes in colleges say, we need to get practitioners in to get, get, make, make people more kind of practical. And I think that's nonsense. I think uh, you know, people in architecture schools need to be able to dream. And you know, we're making a terrible, by and large, making a terrible mess of things in the outside world. And there's a tremendous illogic operates it, it out there. And you know, there's the possibility of real logic and you know, um, uh, you know, being able to operate within an architecture school, which, which I'm very grateful for. So, again, the inevitable models. And I'll finish with this. This is called 100 Miles City. And this is one of those dreams, which should have taken five or 10 minutes, but uh, sort of took hold, and we made this plaster cast model. And it's an idea about if you had to build millions of new homes in London, where would you put them, rather than knocking down social housing, uh, and, uh, or, or allowing the city to spread out into the countryside. And I said, well, what about if we created a linear city that the circumference of London is 100 miles long, and we took out the last 100 metres of suburbia, bungalows and stuff like that, and built a really intense, dense edge to the city. Uh, and anyway, so I said this, build a street-based linear city, 100 miles long, 100 metres wide, and four storeys high. Wrap it around London. So it goes right round. Give it little factories, schools, houses and shops laid out in terraces along intimately scaled streets and around squares. So, so, so clearly that's the countryside, that's suburbia and this is the edge of London. Give it little factory schools. Yeah, make it a dense, intense edge to London, a confident, purposeful boundary fronting a revitalised, productive countryside. Much of the land around London isn't properly used for agriculture. 100 Mile City is a linear Barceloneta, a circular Rome, a stretched Porto, suburbia reprogrammed, hybridised, compressed, catalytic urbanism on fleek. Ride the 100 mile high speed orbital monorail. So, so that there is a monorail which goes right round London. We have a fantastic public transport system, but it, but it operates from the centre of London out to the outskirts. So the idea of our monorail is that it would link the ends of the, of the sort of spokes of the... Of the, of the, of the 
uh, of our otherwise very good system so that people can get from one part of suburbia to another. Ride the 100-mile high-speed orbital monorail, souped-up skyfly circle line, the loose ends and frayed edges of London's transport system, its isolated city edge train and bus termini instantly, meaningfully, usefully connected with circus ride technology. Bexley to Brentford in 40 minutes. Super functional, super fast, and super fun. And in time, watch our city grow inwards. So, you know, that's where it starts. But rather than spreading out to the countryside, it could start to consume suburbia, which could become densified and an extension of this coming back into central London. And in time, watch our city grow inwards, spreading like a wildfire fire, through wasteful, antisocial, car-choked suburbia, eastwards from Richmond, west across the Newham Marshes, up from Eltham, across the hills of Greenwich and the empty green swords and golf courses of Enfield. Metroland consolidated backfilled, integrated, and urbanized. London for 40 million people, a kind of inside-out plan voisin. Ville Radieur's blighty style. So getting in a bit closer. A farmer's market, livestock market in there. Some of the urban blocks. One of the squares. And that's, that's the end. Yeah, that's perfect. And well, Peter, that was amazing. And wow, your sketches are beautiful. And that uh, sketchbook project is very inspiring. Uh, you've certainly um, shown us what uh, happens when dwellers open up to sharing a wall and when authorities support that kind of thing. Uh, you've uh, bothered, to, uh, you, you've shown us um, uh, you bother in your work, sorry, to complexify and call for the, you know, th such things as the healing garden and your designs and their special moments um, give people from the gregarious to the withheld um, opportunities to express themselves and, and build relationships. And, and um, it was really inspiring and beautiful. Uh, so um, I just want to now, of course, open this up. I'm sure we have... So thank you. That was fabulous and fantastic and so inspiring and hopeful. So we've got, I'm sure, questions in the audience. And we've got a... Steve, do I pass this mic around? Is that what we do with this? Oh, Lisa's got... Got it. So we've got a mic that we'll pass around. So raise your hand. And, and Peter's here to answer your questions. By the way, do we have... Oh, Ben, of course, we'll start with you. Ben teaches a wonderful housing studio uh, in our school. Ben Gianni. So Ben, you'll go first. I do want to ask, are there people from OCH here, Ottawa Community Housing? If you are, welcome, and please do uh, um, go ahead. Yeah, so Cliff and Rob basically said they couldn't come tonight from OCH okay. uh, because they have some major treasury meeting, and they're very sorry to miss it, but hopefully. Uh, Ralph and others in the uh, group here are doing housing for OCH, so we have some of the, uh, and Peter, OCH is Ottawa Community Housing. They own about 14,000 units in the city, I think, and uh, have a <clears throat> you know, process of rebuilding parts. But uh, ha having fallen in love with Donnybrook, uh, and the first time I saw that aerial image, I thought it was a foam core model dropped into a photograph. Um, I actually went to see it because I couldn't actually believe it existed. It was so interesting. But what I've noticed clearly is a movement away from that kind of white the absence of material, almost Bahamian or Bermudan kind of architecture to something which is very much North African or I'm having trouble seeing it. Did you get a backlash on the, the, the whiteness and, and, and tautness of those surfaces and then decide to go completely in the other direction? Um, well, so, I mean, I think they both look kind of North African in a way, don't they? Because you can go to, you know, bits of Morocco and it's white and, or Greece or... Uh, so... Um, Donnybrook, they've looked after really beautifully. They really have, the, the Housing Association. But there's another project that we've done, which is bigger, uh, where the Housing Association hasn't done what you need to do with white buildings, which is, you know, decorate them every six, eight, ten years. Um, and it made me think twice about bigger buildings, bigger projects, and housing associations who are effectively uh, sort of absentee landlords, who don't always do what they should do in terms of maintenance of their buildings. Um, and, um, you know, brick is, you know, I mean, it has to be said, actually, that, that, that white stucco architecture is part of our vernacular. There are bits of London, Brighton, 
uh, where whole, you know, Brighton, the whole of Brighton is, as a city is made uh, of that kind of uh, white architecture. And I, I think part of it was I've, I, I've got a bit more relaxed. So early days, I was trying to be my hero. So Adolf Lewis and Le Corbusier, these architects who worked with white. And I, th I thought, if it's architecture, it's got to be white. But I, I don't care about that anymore. And actually, the funny thing is that when people in the East End pass by that building, they, they're not thinking of Le Corbusier, are they? They're not thinking of Adolf Lewis. They're thinking of their holidays in, in Greece. And uh, so, so it, it reminds, me, it reminds them, the thing that they connect with is this sort of Southern European vernacular. Um, but so, yeah, the idea of brick being also part of our, of our sort of tradition, uh, construction tradition, but a, but a much more forgiving material in terms of, you know, you can just let it, it gets better with age. And, um, and, and uh, yeah, and particularly actually in the context of things I was talking about, people growing creepers up and making their mess, it, it kind of, I think, is happier happening in, uh, with, with a brick kind of, in a, in a brick courtyard or stuff, yeah. I noticed a lot on your work, the foliage, you, you stated there's going to be in some, because you have to develop, but all of it seems core-centered, backyard-centered. Is it the cultural or the legal ideology, like this here with the roads on the outside are the bag around it, but there's, I don't see foliage growing there for shading, depending on when you're north, south, east, west, whatever you're, and to my mind, it certainly brings socially all in, but not out to the rest of the city and the people. So have you thought more to, for the sound, the, the light, everything? So, so um, most of them have, have trees in them, those projects. A lot of the photographs are taken very, very early on in the, in the lives of the buildings. So uh, there are, there are I, you know, we can go back and take you back to look at projects where you can hardly see the buildings for trees. Um, sometimes the trees get taken out by a developer who, you know, is wanting to save some money. Sometimes it's the local authority. We've done projects before where we've had street trees shown along the front of the building uh, and the local authority might say, well, we don't want to have the hassle of maintaining them. But um, maybe I need to get some better photos, you know, some more recent photos, because in a lot of the projects there are trees. And the other thing is that um, I think it, it, it's the, the great joy is when people plant. So if we create a planter and people take control of that space, um, and you know, in in that in those slides there were pictures of you know really rather wonderful things that people had done with their courtyards uh, in, in in creating greenery. But I mean, ultimately, it's up to them whether they want to do that. You know, for somebody else, as I say, a gymnasium or a, uh, a um, or just some of their mess or their bicycle or a place to fix their bicycle. So. And maybe sometimes we bring a slightly bourgeois um, sen sensibility to these situations. Somebody there's got a question. Oh, there's one there. Great. Hi. How are you doing? I saw you earlier today. I give you the tour. You did. You showed me around. <laughs> That's good. Uh, your your um, lecture was amazing, and uh, your last project here, the 100 Mile uh, City, reminded me a lot of what's happening in Saudi Arabia with the line, which I think is like 100 miles long also, approximately. Um, I want to know when did you kind of come with up with this concept, and what was your uh, thought process on the potential for urban spaces in, in such a, a tightly dense um, style of living and also you know yours is I guess a radial city almost but in a line around London but do you think this is something that could be happening in in places where like London where it's pretty dense and you're looking at um, parts of the, the almost kind of the countryside uh, do you think cities and a topology like this is something that might be Happening later on in the future, or a possibility? Well, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's more, a, it's more of a provocation than anything, anything else. It's to get people talking and thinking and wondering about where we might put all this housing. And in fact, um, I've slightly 
re revise my position on this. I mean, it, uh, just to say, it shares the name with that dreadful thing they're doing in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. That's all it shares with it. Yeah. Um, um, but um, it, it, th this, this uh, proposal um, assumes that you rely on the government's um, statistics, which said we, we need all these millions of homes in London. But more recently, I've been thinking, uh, you know, in connection with the, all those empty homes in the north of England, that maybe uh, the, this sort of concentration on the construction of houses in London is wrong and that we need to be um, allocating our resources out of London. It's a great complaint that you get from people who live in other areas of London. The sort of um, indices of deprivation in our coastal cities, particularly in the north of England, and also the number of empty homes there. So rather than building a million homes here, what about investing in, you know, for instance, green energy production in the north of, uh, in the north of England and attracting people back into homes which already exist, which are just empty? So um, th this was a few years ago, and I, I think I'll probably get it wrong, actually. Yeah. I guess I just have a quick follow-up question to that. I guess you kind of speaking to the countryside. And I know Ram Coolhouse is, uh, I recently discovered he's asking similar questions on what's happening in the countryside with the rates of urbanization and do you think this is oh okay i thought it went out for a second do you think these are things we have to start looking at is uh how are people living um in the countryside and is something we should be looking at instead of densifying areas yes i do I, and um you know i haven't brought any of the stuff we're doing with with college at the moment but one of the things we're looking at is some um, sites in the countryside kind of brownfield sites old airport sites uh, there's talk at the moment of, of, in the UK of building new towns, but I know that those new towns are just the same old, same old, and it's, you know, boxes with four cars parked outside. And I think if we think, in, you know, more profoundly in the way that Rem Cool has started to, and lots of people have taken it up now, of, about, of a more, you know, thinking about, the, you know, what people do, and, you know, is, most of our villages are simply um, places where wealthy people live and... and um, uh, and commute into towns in their, you know, smart cars. But if we thought about a, you know, newly productive countryside with new industries and new forms of agriculture, uh, we currently import half of our food in, in our country. Uh, we import half of our energy. So if we, if we kind of fo fo focused our minds on dealing with those two things, rather than perhaps building housing which people don't need in London, then that might be another way of, of kind of uh, allocating resources and thinking creatively about the problem of housing. Hi, Peter. Hello. Um, thank you for your talk. It was, it was compelling and, and very inspiring. Um, I'm, I'd like to talk about the, the strength of the, the focus in the, on, on the, the central courtyards and gardens. And I'm curious about how you, what mechanisms are at play in your at that level of design to ensure that people are um, engaging with these spaces on a level that goes kind of just beyond sitting in them and passing through them and enjoying them, but rather specifically with the gardens, acting as gardeners and treating that as a shared garden. Like, do they do that readily or is there something that you are incorporating in a design to kind of facilitate that? Well, you can't, you can't force people to do anything. And, uh, you know, some developers and some architects will say, we're going to build a community here. And I don't believe you can. I, think, um, I, I don't think you can. I think you can create the conditions where it's possible for a community to emerge. And I think you can prevent people from living like that. So if you think about, you know, I've been championing the idea of street-based housing. But if you think about its an antithesis uh, in gated housing, and there are whole cities in this world which are gated cities, uh, then uh, just the simple fact of uh, making streets and public squares is the first step in that direction. Beyond that, I don't, you, you can't force people to do anything, can you? So, so and, and sometimes you go back and nothing's happened. Well, that's up to them. You know, they're really busy doing something. They're, sister's not very well, so they're spending a lot of time over there, or they haven't got a, a tuppence eight need to spend on plants. Um, there are all sorts of factors which govern what people do. But as architects, we can create the conditions for people to take, pick up the mantle and, you know, and do stuff. But they won't necessarily do that. Uh, and, the, and the alternative, of course, is to, uh, is, uh, you know, and there are places where this is appropriate. 
uh, is to say, well, we're going to plant some plants and they're going to be maintained by the housing association or something like that. And that's always a bit miserable. Hello. Yeah, hello. So first of all, thank you for the lecture. It was very, very inspiring. Um, I was particularly inspired by the, um, the courtyard housing for the, what is, for the homeless people, was it? Um, so I used to live in a, um, it's called, called Hofje, so like a little courtyard housing right. in, in the Netherlands. Um, uh -huh. And it was, it's beautiful to see that you would offer something like this yeah. for, for the homeless. Um, my, my question was about uh, when you were speaking about the arches, you said it's not cheap and it's not easy, but it's important. Mm. And I kind of see that as applying to also the little intricacies, the little details that you have in your housing, which I find very beautiful. But then my question is, how do you deal with the fact that it's not cheap and it's not easy? So do you find that it puts you at a competitive disadvantage? Mm. Do you find that you get backlash from developers? Do they try to discourage you from building these aspects? And how do you deal with that? Well, well there's always, so there's always a dis discussion. And um, the, the one by the, 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 the busy motorway was f for a developer. And it's got 50% social housing. So the stuff that was for sale helps to pay for the... the um, so from his point of view, the expectation for that site was 40 homes. By being inventive and creative, we were able to get 100 homes there and to deal with, the, you know, with that sort of rind of buildings against the motorway. And the other thing about that project is that, as I say, and I said it earlier on, there's no common area of circulation. We've already saved him millions of pounds because he's not building any of those corridors. So it gives us a bit of extra, extra cash to kind of do things which I think are more kind of socially beneficial, like a little arch or a little quirk. Um, but but it, but it's not always easy, and at, right, right at the moment we've got big problems. I don't know whether it's the same here, but in our um, housing market, as they call it, um, house prices are, are, are not very buoyant, and the costs of construction have gone crazy post you know Ukraine war, COVID, and for us um, you know coming out of Europe. So that equation is really tricky, and it's something we always have to deal with. But um, you know, we, we, you've looked at you know quite a number of projects where we've managed to hold on to some architectural ideas, uh, and I think we do that by uh, you know saving money elsewhere, for instance, by not building circulation and so on. Oh, we've got a, one more over here. Yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Barber, thank you for such a great presentation. And I actually wanted to ask a bit more specific question. Um, I just came back from London, UK, and I live in Embassy Gardens, which is right next to the first image of a, sorry, what's the Battersea Station, right? And you said that the Battersea Station development is, um, not unquote, but it's not a great development of where it's supposed to go. And the direct question that I had, I personally, I go there from time to time, and that's I spend a lot of time, and I personally found it a really interesting site and the way they created redevelopment of such an iconic site for London. Um, I, that ability to walk in such a like, redeveloped site, to bring in people inside, and just to be in the space, around the space, I found that the redevelopment of the space was just perfect and like that we can bring in more people. And did you mean that it wasn't a good redevelopment in the way that the buildings didn't really speak of the surrounding site and of the building? Like I agree there were some few buildings, especially Frank Gehry one that definitely doesn't fit in, but I felt that the culture and atmosphere was definitely there because uh, moving forward, this spills out to all the other buildings around the world that we're redeveloping right now, right? Like, and were you specifically talking about Barisi Station of the buildings around it, or the development of the Battersea Station of itself? Um, well, I think some of the things they've done in the shopping center apparently are, are okay, but uh, I think it's a project which is, it's, it's, it's so expensive to live there. It's impossible to, for anybody with a sensible salary to live there. And so I don't think that's what we should be doing. I think, you know, we've got a homelessness problem in London. We should be building homes that people can afford to live in. And, and you know, a lot, I, I, don't, I haven't got the figures on Battersea, but there will be a lot of those flats which are empty and are second homes for overseas buyers. So that's the thing that I suppose I really object to. Yeah, just quickly. Uh, so I noticed you really try to encourage the occupant to take hold of the space. I was wondering if you ever 
engage in participatory uh, design, like with the would-be occupants, and if that's something that interests you. Occasionally, occasionally it's possible, but I mean, the, the means of production of housing in our country distances us in, in very many instances from the end user. So we're working for a, a, a developer. Uh, we're building the thing with a, with a contractor who we don't have a very intimate connection with. Uh, and the person who buys it at the end is unknown until the last minute. That said, there are projects, and I haven't shown, the thing, I mean, clearly the homeless project is a different kettle of fish. And there are projects where we work on in, in uh, council estates, local authority estates, where we are, in the past, we've actually been chosen by a group of residents to do the project. They've got a bit of land or something like that. Uh, and I, I think some architects are a bit, um, well, we're quite easy to chat to, I think. And, and so we had a, we were interviewed, you know, get interviewed by the people and, um, and then, you know, you can have a, a, a rapport and an, an understanding with them. Um, and it, but it kind of completely depends on the setup. And I, I know I think there's nothing better than a great sort of client end user and the, the most sort of creative projects come out of that kind of dialogue. Uh, it's the same as if you're doing a house for, if you've got a great client who wants a house built, you know, uh, the best projects come out of a really good sort of bouncing ideas off each other. And um, so sometimes that's possible. Not often enough, though. Um, Peter, uh, I think we, we, well, first of all, um, you can all please stay and chat with Peter for a few minutes after, but we will. That will we'll wrap up That's the Q&A. Yes. So you gave us so much. You gave our students uh, and our community a lot to think about. I think our students will get their sketchbooks going and design do that. 365 cities get a off year. Get that computer. Maybe. Yeah. Um, and so I just want to leave you with, with maybe so two things. <laughs> OK. One is this poster, which has your name on it. And by the way, on the poster front, anyone who, who has a space that maybe a cafe or an architect's office or lunchroom. I have some of these, so come and get one to post so we get uh, the word out for the, we have um, four more lectures this year, so I do have some and love to give them out uh, for posting. And I wanna leave you with one thing, Peter, because I, you're staying downtown, I think at Laurier, and all, a lot of those buildings down there were civil service uh, office buildings which have been, have kind of running into an identity crisis because COVID led to a kind of emptying out of the buildings. And so these, a lot of them were looking at uh, conversion into housing. Ottawa has a housing shortage and an affordable housing shortage. So maybe that's your next city is Ottawa. <laughs> and um, Count me yeah, because you know how to turn those office blocks uh, into muses and gardens and you know, socially beautiful and uh, gentle places to live. So um, I see that book there, and I hope you take on downtown Ottawa as cities uh, 200 to 365, maybe. Anyway, um, so we cannot thank you enough, and uh, it was it was wonderful. And please, anyone who has another question, come on down and chat with Peter for a few minutes, and let us give uh, Peter uh, a big warm uh, round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. And uh, thank you, Steve, for everything you did to make this streaming possible. Anyone who went into the streaming room said, genius. They loved it. So if we do this again here, uh, so thanks, everyone. And thanks for coming. Good night. I would